Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 166. This episode is with the fantastic Anne Kloss Farley. She's an award-winning costume designer who's worked all over the world and is also one of the most fun people I've ever met. I first met Anne in her living room when I went to meet her husband, previous guest of the show, Keith Farley, and we immediately hit it off, and I knew I had to try and get her on the show. Luckily for all of us, she agreed. In this show, we talk about her being one of 14 kids, the greatest talent show story ever, being okay with failure, how she switched from being an actor to becoming a costume designer, dressing an entire production with materials from a 99 cent store, working on Toy Story the Musical, the importance of community, and so much more. Anne is a blast. You're going to love her. So let's just get right into it. Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 166, with Anne Kloss Farley. Theme song time. Day going? It's good. I'm uh, teaching at USC right now. Nice. Uh, nice. Costume design. So um, I put together a um, a little Canva video on what I'm going to talk about. Oh, cool. On Tuesday, I have a two-hour lecture. Oof. So to break it up, I like to do, I'm going to do a craft. So I'm going to teach them how to sew by making sock mo- monsters. So I said, bring a pair of socks. Nice. And then we'll chop it up for the season, do a little monster. And uh, and I'll you know pair it with talking about the mutant toys that I got to design for Toy Story the Musical. Oh, cool! And I like, love that making beauty out of things that are supposed to be unattractively delightful. I mean, sure. mutants. You're just like, yes, I prefer to design yeah. mutants. <laughs> <laughs> Regular people, whatever. That's right. So. That's right. <laughs> unattractively delightful is the name of my memoir. Right. <laughs> and I, I find like I. I've never been one to identify with the word normal. Dude, right there with you. I it's hate that word. Same. There's nothing normal ever. No. no. We're, it... we're all mutants, and, and that is collectively a better story. And if yeah. we could avoid that word, if we could ban that word in the yeah. future, I think society would be much healthier. <laughs> I totally agree. That and I, I, my least favorite word in any language is realistic because oh there's no such thing. It's like when you understand that what is realistic for one person is not realistic for another person, it means none of it matters because there is no realistic. Like, okay, I'll, I'll match you with one size fits all. Ooh, yeah. I hate that it's category. Nuts. Like, what is that? That doesn't exist for anyone. Yeah. And you know that's going to be an unattractive piece of clothing. It's going <laughs> to be crappy and you're going to have to make it your own by fucking with it. So. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Real. that that word is one of my least favorite descriptions of things. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I, I I live by this. Will Smith is like my guy and has been since I was like eight years old. I was like, that yeah. is my hero now. And one of my favorite quotes by him was uh, being realistic is the most commonly traveled path to mediocrity. Yep. And I've always like, right. And exactly I'm just weird. True. You got to I feel like as I've gotten older, the more I like just let the flag fly and i'm like i'm a very strange person and if i send that out i find i make a lot of really cool friends because they're like hey me too and then you have that like right. you don't have that social norms you know to kind of go through it's like what is what is life no there's no rules there's no rules nobody knows well i think you know when i think back about the transition from elementary to middle school and oh, then yeah. the peer pressure of being normal like in elementary, you get to be a spaz and just explore without mm-hmm. all the labeling. And then the labeling comes in and I watch some of my favorite human beings go normal. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, wait, you are so exciting. Just six months ago. What <laughs> happened to you? And then I just got pissed off all the way through middle school, watching yeah, people no. gravitate to the herd mentality. Yeah. 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 And I was like, why would you do that to yourself? It's so unexciting. I agree. 
And then Amazing. you battle, you know, anxiety and depression until you get to college. And I think teaching college right now, and I have two um, kids who are in 19, between 19 and 21, I feel like I've I've been living with this age, so yeah. <laughs> I have to say that last class, I I just felt this apathy as schools are not really they they're toting that they're talking about COVID, but they're not really addressing it, the mental health aspect of the impact sure. of school and what happened last year and what's still happening. Yeah, everybody's pretending just because we're wearing a mask that it's not happening, but it, yeah. it is. It's here. Yep. It's happening, and it's going to be a decade of unraveling that trauma, right? Yeah. So, Easy. so we went into class, and I'm looking at everybody, and I said, "How many times did you hear this week th about the real world?" Yeah. <laughs> and they, they all raised their hands, and I said, "You know, you're at the age where you can just stop that." elder person in their tracks and say it doesn't get any real than this yeah i am real. the real world stop insulting me yeah no. you, have, you have permission to say that and they all just fell out and i gave them five ways to say it nicely there you and go said, if this adult is a repeat offender about the real world yeah. now you go to you go to level two that's right <laughs> oh you want to see what's real that's Let right. me tell you what's real. Boundaries. I'm hitting boundaries. So that's right. It was really, it was really interesting to to see them realize that they had power in the situation to start advocating for themselves a little bit. Sure. That's good. Those are important skills to have, especially right? moving forward. Right. What, what a wild time we're living in. I I would say it's gonna be great when we get through them. You know, it's like on the other side of all of this, we can be like, remember a pandemic. That was wild. Huh. Wow. I'm telling you, as a costume designer, I love seeing cinema and stage where they're incorporating the masks because yeah. 20 years from now, this is the reality of how we're expressing ourselves and then how ingenious are we at doing this. Yeah. And 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 then I see other artists who are just pretending it doesn't exist. Oh, we don't want to use masks and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, this is your present tense. Yeah. What are we doing about that? And how sure. are we making that funky? Like, yeah. Wow. And for me, I'm an, I'm a rebel. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a counterculture person saying like, okay, is this what I have? Okay. What, how do I fuck with that? How do I twist yeah. that into something interesting? Cause this is my reality. And if you deny sure. the reality, then we're not dealing with right now. <laughs> sure. Then it's not truthful, which is yeah. the whole point of art. Yeah. yeah. And my grandkids or, or the young kids coming up behind us, have a way to say, you know, which it's their responsibility to look at us and be like, you're fucked up, older people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to solve the problem you couldn't figure out. And That's so, right. <laughs> <laughs> I find that to be a nice challenge. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I kind of, I kind of like it. I, I've never thought about it from the point of view of a costume designer as well, that like people incorporate masks into their outfits now. So there's like, oh, I have a bunch of different colors and stuff. It's a way to accessorize almost. It's just, I've never looked at it that way. That's very interesting. Yeah, it says a lot about you, what you pick. Yeah. You know, and um, I find that really interesting. I had coffee with one of my students outside. I've been teaching her for five months, five weeks now, no, six weeks now. And she took down her mask and I was like, holy crap, I don't even know what you look like. Yeah. <laughs> and we both had a moment of just laughing. She was like, oh, I didn't think your mouth would look like that. Sure. <laughs> I know. Isn't that amazing that we are coexisting and bonding without half our faces? Sure. We're just eyes for a, yeah. for a year. Which I think humanity has been trying to get us to incorporate the eyes in a very yeah. deep level. So I'm hopeful that we're transitioning into a place of deepness through having to pay attention. Yeah. We're expressing. <laughs> yeah, I know so many people who don't look at your face when they talk to you. They look around your face. Oh, really? And, oh, man. and now that that's all you have, they're forced to address you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. The windows yeah. of the soul. Yeah. That's how that works. Well, you're a blue-eyed person, too. So. I am a blue-eyed person. Yeah, yeah, I got them from my grandparents, actually, because neither of my parents have blue eyes. Isn't that weird? Well, no. I mean, my mom has brown eyes and my dad has green eyes. Yeah. And I'm a family of 14. So if you, if you shift, you know, the little Yahtzee. Just, yeah, shake them up. <laughs> Where are you at in 14? Um, I'm number nine. 
Nine. Wow. <clears throat> right? You're on, the, you're on the back end. I am. But I have blue eyes. And there's only, there's a handful of, less than a handful of us with blue eyes. Only one person with my dad's green eyes. But the rest have brown eyes like my mom. So we're, oh. we're kind of 50-50. But I thought the green eyes, it was interesting that only one in my family got the green eyes. Wow. And, and my daughter got green eyes. And really? Both and I, yeah, both Keith and I do not have green eyes. I have blue eyes. He has brown eyes. His mom has brown eyes. His dad has blue eyes. But somehow, huh. Ruby, my youngest, got the shakeup of my father's green eyes. That's so cool. Right? Genetics, man, is weird. It's I know. such a lottery. I, I love it that you don't get to choose your color. I mean, you Me do too. officially. Yeah, yeah. But you're, that's what you're stuck with. But yeah. I'll take the blue eyes. I like having blue eyes. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. They they kind of work. I have one that works significantly better than the other one, but they look good. So that yeah, helps. I'm there with you. Mine are yeah. progressing into different dimensions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it comes with a superhero trick. Your eyes are like, well, now for you real see through things, right? I mean, I think it's sixty. I should be able to see through things. I think so too. I think so I mean, too. Degree, but at the very least, like intent. You know what I mean? That's right. <laughs> I don't think that. As you mature and wise, wisen, I think that's supposed to be what you do when you get older. Yeah. That you should get superhero traits with your eyes. Your eyes should be the window of your soul and reflect what mm. you love. So then all of us would have Marvel. I agree. Marvel bonuses. I agree. <laughs> or would be terrible. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, look at that, guys. I, I don't want to be around. Ooh, fool. Which I guess would be good for people around him to know it's like a red flag. Right. Well, you're supposed to be wise by that point, which means yeah, you'll yeah, be a little bit more honorable or respectful. But yeah. I guess that's wishful thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can be that. We can figure it out. <laughs> right. I always hope. I have yeah. good hope. I'm a hopeful I think, person. I think you have to. I survive on hope. It's the only way through, you know? Right? Me too. I, I think I've been blessed with hope. I don't know what that is, but I didn't have the greatest childhood. Me neither. But, but that stayed intact for yeah. somehow like somehow i'm like yeah I, I think everybody is the best they can be at all times until they prove otherwise sure yeah <laughs> i think the food i'm about to eat should be good yeah even if it disappoints me i'm like well yeah it's here i guess i'm eating it i'm hopeful yeah. that it will do its job that's right um, but, but yeah I, it takes a lot to disappoint me i think yeah i'm right there with you and I think people judged me for that for a really long time. Like people get jealous yeah. of your hopeful demeanor. Have you had that? Defi oh yeah. Oh my God. I, I just started uh, Ted Lasso recently. Mm. Huh. Huh. I've Talk never, hope. I've <laughs> never found a show that was more specifically me. <laughs> and like, I was like, Oh, right. That's me in 10 years. Got it. Okay. Understood. <laughs> And like they talk about that, like the idea that in England they have the thing that's saying that it's the hope that kills you. And he's like, no, 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 it's it's the other way around. It's the hope that keeps you going. That's and right. I think I think so. I, I think that's the only way that you can get through really hard times is you have to have hope that they will end. You know, right, right. I At think, least for me. Well, I think so, too. You know, I think I went through, you know, this great anger at a point in my life when sure. things were so dark and I got really angry and then I met anger in a really intense way. Mm -hmm. And through that relationship with anger, when I came out on the other side, I realized that it only goes up really. Yeah. Yeah. And so once you've been to the bottom, I think with disappointment and anger and sadness and brokenness, you, you find like, Oh, everything's great. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> great. <laughs> Then you have the reference. Oh, it can what? always be worse. And then you're like, all right. Yeah. yeah. At least it's yeah. not that. Yeah. yeah. And I keep that little timeline in my head. So I'm yeah. like, no, it, this is good. This is good. Let's go. Yeah. But yeah. it's opened up to my sense of failure and um, to being uh, positive. And, you know, so I, you know, I always tell people, they're like, oh, well, you seem like you don't have any boundaries. Cause I'm always like, oops, made a mistake. Oh, let's go. That yeah. mistake was pretty cool. Let's <laughs> go over here. And I realized that my failures are the things that have actually been my biggest progress. So sure. once I've made, you know, we wouldn't have light without mistakes, right? Yeah. Electricity. So, Facts. so once you just realize like, oh yeah, my failures are actually my key to success. You know, if you do everything by the book, 
it, it could come out normal, which is what we started with, which is sure. boring. Yeah. And, and so I find that, you know, when I don't stay within the lines and I take the risk and it does come out um, unexpected, sometimes people say, you know, those are failures. And I'm like, no, that was unexpected. But th- most of the time that process brought me to the unique original result. Sure. Is that something you had to like learn to like be okay with failing or did like you just come naturally to it? Well, you know, I am dyslexic and oh, I, I didn't know that. I, yeah, I was not diagnosed until my senior year after um I had moved schools and the new school when I when I when I uh, took the test to get into school, they were like why do you have a fourth grade education? How did you get to be a senior? (laughs) And, and then we had a big long conversation and she said, you're really smart. I said, yeah, I'm really smart. I just have had trouble reading. Um, and I, I take everything in orally. So I loved lectures and asking questions. And because of that, I asked a lot of questions. A lot of people are book smart. Don't ask questions. Right. They just read the book. And I found the questions to be, you know, you get you get lectures in outlines. And so I was missing all the detail from the books. <laughs> and so by asking questions, what what is this? How does this go? People actually tell you the truth of their own process instead of hearing it from a book. So I feel like I have this apprentice style education. I've since learned, you know, uh, I've you know, I read but I've since learned to become a better reader and deal with my dyslexia. So sure, now sure. I have both because my job as a costume designer is I'm a researcher. Sure. I, I love history and knowledge and, and I need to know all that in order to do what I do. Um, but I was able to partner up with a lot of adults who took me on under their wing because they were like, you're smart, let's catch you up. Oh, cool. And let's give you opportunities. So I learned not only to think for my outside the box, I, I, I design outside the box. And a lot of other designers used to hate, hate my <laughs> process and my work because, um, because I decided to experiment. And sure. I use experimentation in my work quite a bit. That's good. That's art. That's yeah. Art. Yeah. And I think I've learned that I'm I'm an artist as well as a costume designer. I love, I do many things besides costume design. Sure. Um, sure. But um, I think it has freed me from having a stationary life, you know, one track life. Good. I find so many things exciting. And, yeah. and uh, during COVID, it was awesome because my entire job was flatlined. Like nobody was working. Sure. <clears throat> and so... I thought about things that I wanted to do when I retired and I was like, I'm doing them now. So I taught myself how to web design. I taught my, I took some photography classes, started photography. Yeah. Some character work I'm not able to do in movies and television and on stage that are distinctly my own sense of humor. Yeah. So I started getting together with people and, and exploring those images, which is amazing. And now that's become its own thing for me and um, its own freedom of my personal art to be able to do uncensored art for myself, which I didn't have time to do before. Yeah. So oh, I, I felt that. like COVID is exploded the next place I'm gonna go in my life. And sure. I started producing a podcast with my husband and- It's great. Thank you. But but producing that and being able to call in my friends and, and being able to help Keith um, uh, delve into what he's always wanted to do and to support another artist in that way has been really exciting. Yeah. So I think producing and exercising that producing um, format has been, I'm like, what am I, want, what do I want to produce of my, of my own work? So, sure. So sure. it's freed me in, in a whole other level. So good. I'm looking forward to the next adventures. So That's amazing. That. So uh, COVID has actually been a blessing for me. Sure. Sure. I, I do love the idea that when constraints breed creativity, mm-hmm. it's like vine was like a big thing. And the, the thing that I found so interesting about vine was that you had seven seconds. And that's all you have. Everybody has seven seconds. What are you going to do with it? And it has since spawned into other crazy things. And with COVID, the idea that the traditional sense had all shut down. It goes, okay, but you're still an artist who wants to create things. 
good luck, see what happens. And then some really cool stuff comes from that because you are constrained, which I imagine right. with a, with costumes as well, you have X amount of fabrics to work with. You have this genre, this time period, make art with these constraints. And that's right. where you really shine, being able to do that, which is pretty cool. I think, you know, my biggest superpower in costume design is I've always been good at um, making something out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> making, making a costume with what's in the room. And um, people would hire me. I, we can't we can't figure out how to do this. And can you come over and take a peek at what it is? And I'm like, yeah, I've got my trusty pair of scissors and chop, 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 chop. And here we go. It's something new at the end of the day. And I just don't have fear in transforming something. It's not sure. It's I I think. I think what it is is everything is precious, but it's really not. It's sure. all transformable. <laughs> sure. Is that like a confidence thing? You're like, is it confidence in like you just know it's going to turn out one way or another, or is it confidence in like abilities? Where where is that? Well, again, I have a huge um, bank in my head of history and historical yeah accuracy about what things are. So. I know now at this age of 50, I, for the last 30 years, I've been researching humans and their characteristics and our, our clothing and how we express ourselves. Mm -hmm. So now I have an ability to look at something and shuffle it. Oh, cool. <laughs> so I know what the audience needs to see in the silhouette of it, what it needs to be, and that we can emotionally oh. get in it, what it evokes. Sure. And, and then I can mess it up and make something that we all identify with because it's all the historical accuracy and the points in, in expression are in it. And so that is, is a tool. That's a super tool. That's sure. Like in my toolbox of life skills. Yeah. And my favorite thing to do is to go into schools and um, talk about costuming and what it is and what my job is about being able to express um, a person's whole interior and, and exterior dialogue through clothes sure you know, why, why do you pick out the t-shirt you picked out today sure <laughs> what does that say about your day today <laughs> and who you are and um and i'll bring the kids up to, in the in the class and and break down the clothes that they're wearing and if they're in elementary their mother most likely bought their clothes sure and so a lot of times they have no idea what they're wearing <laughs> and then I'll read the label, what it's made out of, where it was made, and who made it. And if it's branded, I'll tell them what their brand mission statement is and what that brand says about you selecting someone else's mission statement to wear on your chest. Interesting. And so then all of a sudden they're like, what? And I was like, this is how you identify with the clothes that you pick. Sure. And this says everything about who you are. Interesting. And, and then all of a sudden they're like, I don't want to say that. And well, that's, yeah. what your mother, that's what your mother says you are. So, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, it's really interesting. And then, you know, being able to, I have this, you know, after years of doing this, I know, you know, when I look at you, what if by your height, the mm -hmm. standards for, you know, what your shoe size would normally be for this height. And if you're if you tell me your weight and then you tell me your your waist size i can pretty much tell you what your suit size is and match your waist to your chest and i'm pretty good at being like oh yeah you're a 38 sure you know, like sort of that's thing. cool yeah. I, lo I love that that's how tall are you? you have <laughs> we could do this how tall are you i am 510 with shoes okay and um uh what size neck do you have I have no idea. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So do you do a medium shirt, dress shirt? I do. So you're like a 15 and a half neck and you wear what, okay. a 38 suit? That's a great question that I don't have the answer <laughs> to. <laughs> so, okay, is this too personal, but is your no, waist No, I just don't size, know. Your waist size uh, 32? Oh, you're good. You're and good. Is your shoe a nine and a half, 10? Wow. Yeah. Is it? it? Is. Okay. Yeah. But that is, that is like years of knowing like the standardized sizing. That's so cool. Yeah. Right. It's like a mechanic that hears like, all right. Yeah. It's that sort of that's carburetor. Exactly yeah. I love yeah, that. That's exactly it. It's such a, <laughs> such a neat skill set that like you just, uh, which comes from experience doing it yeah. over and over. And like, that's awesome. It's really funny to go to award shows 
And after doing shows, uh, live theater in LA for 25 years, yeah, um, I go to award shows and I know everybody's shoe size and mostly what everybody looks like naked. Yeah. That's my job. <laughs> there you go. That's my job. Like whose job is that? <laughs> so <laughs> it's like that thing when it's like, just picture everyone naked. You're like, I have to. Yeah. It's part of it. <laughs> That's what I do. I map your body. I try to choose the best things about it. And then, you know, also my job is to emotionally evoke, you know, evoke what this character is saying. Sure. And so being able to take an actor and also transform them from head to toe into something yeah. that's really fun, sure. but then really find the root of that actor. It's it's for me, it's really hard because <clears throat> the way live theater is structured, um, you have, um, you meet the actor um, after you've already decided what the show is going to look like with the set designer and, mm -hmm. um, and the director and then you meet them and they go on their actor journey right <laughs> i'm like well <laughs> that's kind of so what it does is then i have to pause and everything that i came up with allow the actor to go on their journey and contribute with me and uh, to make it unique and oftentimes sure. you don't get that opportunity i think that's it's so it's so sad for me that the actor and the costumer often get gypped of that conversation sure. unless you have months and years to prepare in sure. movies, you have a longer time to have that conversation. Right. But live theater has become so expensive that they've actually, there's this game of catching up and, mm -hmm. and, and trying to fit it in. But for me, I like to work with the actor and find out what they're doing and then make it unique to them. If you're sure. going to do a show like Wicked, mm -hmm. there are iconic images you can't fool with, but there right. is room to make it your own original um sure like your take on it of that. yeah mm -hmm. and i i like to per pervert iconic things a little bit yeah you got to you got yeah to. yeah i always tell kids in in the next generation's lifetime we will be doing harry potter all over again for sure for sure and the archetypes the are there just yeah. play with the toys yeah yeah and if you read the book you know uh, luna doesn't need to you know look that way and yeah. harry can be he's you know got brown eyes, brown hair, and a scar. Yeah. But there's a lot of brown-haired, brown-eyed boys that don't look like Daniel Radcliffe. Yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and it's, there. it's fun to say that to an elementary kid who's just experiencing it. They go, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Me? Yeah. And then purists will be like, it doesn't look like the old Harry Potter. And you're like, oh, come of on. Of course. You're like, guys. Let's have fun. Let's have, it's magic. It's like, magic. Right? I can see behind you with Star Wars. Yeah. It's, it's interesting yeah. how many people are purists about the old Star Wars. Oh, and my God. Yeah. How they can't handle the news. And you're like, just let it grow. Yeah. Yeah. Let it transform. I'm like, it's, a, it's, it's best when it's weird. Like, the Empire was defeated by teddy bears. Come on, guys. It was always this weird. And you're like, no, it's actually this. No, it isn't. They're teddy bears with spears and sticks. They defeated guys with guns. Listen, it's fun. They're Muppets. Let's let's have a good time. Right. I, I love it because you're a kid. <laughs> That's right. I always joke that it's just like religion. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. Star Wars is a religion of itself. It's got the, definitely it's got all of it's stuck in it, and 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 of course there are the purists, and then those who are right <laughs> off to interpret any way they want. Uh huh. So there are those who read a book like, and it's like this is good. There are other people's like this is a weapon. <laughs> You're like yes. oh, oh, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> wild absolutely wild wait so you're one of 14 that's a lot it's but too much i find that a lot of people who are one of a lot a lot of them go into theater and entertainment because you you try to make your own way in a crowd if that makes sense like where where did your interest in entertainment start like what made you want to get into that well what's interesting is i I thought about this a lot because you know the chaos of my family it's chaos when you have that i know the feeling people, right it's mm -hmm. chaos and so theater is chaos and the arts are chaos too right it's like going straight into from my chaos of my family with a lot of people trying to make sense of something and mm -hmm. then theater and film and television is it's exactly the same thing and sure. it's also built that when you start to tell stories and you adopt a new family it's very family yeah feeling. oh yeah 
complicated. So, so it's just the word family translates from one to the other. But as a kid, when the chaos of my family started turning darker, you mm-hmm. know, addiction started falling into the family and, sure. and, and violence with my siblings, believe it or not, um, I had more sibling abuse because we were raising each other, sure. and giving each other a lot of misinformation. It was the 70s, too, where sure. the Charlie Brown parents were, <laughs> yep. were, were in another room. And sure, sure. Um, and so we were raising ourselves in in a world, too, where we were filled with cultism. Ah, makes sense. And, you know, we're seeing this on Netflix and everybody's talking, my age are talking about the cultism of our decades. Sure. Of growing up in the 70s and 80s and 90s, mm-hmm. um, which I find completely validating, by the way. Yeah, I bet. Uh, I, I, you know, I, people are like, why are you so obsessed with it? I'm like, I live this. This is right. Yeah, because <laughs> it's true. Um, <laughs> you know, my mother was also pre-Vatican Catholic. She was. Ah. That'll do it. Um, she's a cult personality herself. And sure. so she was a rapture woman. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and at one point, because things got so dark with my older brothers and sisters, we moved to the border of Mexico in the middle of nowhere. Wow. And somehow she felt that I think that escaping the city and going to the middle of nowhere, it we would not be privy to that, except for she moved us to the border where drug trafficking was right, yeah. coming over. The best place, it. really. <laughs> so it literally was like, open your mouth wide. And sure. it was, and because that was not a part of her mindset, she just didn't recognize that that was good. Totally. Happen. So, um, and so, yeah, so we were plucked in, out into the middle of nowhere and my mom went through love-hate relationship with whether or not we had a TV in the house or not. Mm. And so I really did not get television. And when we did, I was obsessed with black and white movies, old movies. Cool. Uh, I, because it was a different world than my own. Sure. I could Escapism. To them. And then totally. I, my dad would come home and read stories. And that was the pretty much the only time I had with him at that point. By the time I was 10, he was working double shifts. And he was either asleep or at work. So, sure. so the only time I had with him was this relationship of let me tell you a story that he I think he read in the reader's digest right oh cool and, and so I had these pictures of thrillers and you know um, yeah suspense thrillers and and dramas and I think I just hooked on to that and knew that there was another world outside my world that I wanted mm-hmm. to be a part of um my brother had um a drunk driving accident where he um accidentally killed one of his best friends and six of my siblings were in that car and the town was very upset very small town sure and we were asked to leave and so yeah so we had to move from the farm uh, in arizona to um a little highway town in new mexico which is i can only explain it was like a very twin peak style Uh. town (laughs) um (laughs) set in the 80s with you know crazy um, and craziness that was there um and um and and then by the time we hit that town um drug addiction in in my siblings started escalating and sure it just got really out of hand my mom didn't know how to deal with it and it just got piled on and i went to high school with this woman who had just come from new york and who took over the drama department and she plucked me out of a group and said you have to be in my class and, wow. uh, and that was that I, I had just won i had just won my eighth grade talent show oh what'd you do in the eighth grade I lip synced and danced to like a virgin at my Catholic oh, school yes. <laughs> talent show. I knew I liked you. I knew oh, I liked let me, you. Let me tell you, this story is Please. awesome. <laughs> because I had a mean girls experience where I directed and choreographed a dance with my girlfriends. And of course, I'm a poor girl in a Catholic school. Sure. And um, I made the costumes and I bought my first album, which was Like a Virgin. And then the second one was um, Cindy Lauper. And I thought She Bop was so funny when I found out it was about masturbation. Sure. I knew the, nuns, I knew the not, nuns would not know what that was. So I was like, <laughs> okay, we're doing these orange costumes and big hair and we're going to do this whole thing and no one will know and it'll be our sub- subversive sort of thing. Sure. So, so I, 
I was also um, going to audition because I was a really good dancer and and I was going to audition for the school, the high school's um, drill team, which mm-hmm. was really popular in the 80s. Gotcha. Drill teams were everything. Yeah. And they were different than cheerleaders because they came out and they could do the sexy dances. Yeah. And like, you know, whip it up. Yeah. And um, so at the same time as the talent show. So I auditioned. The, the high school girls came to our school. We auditioned. And then I got in, but they gave me this paper that said it was going to cost like $2,500 to be in the drill team. Yikes. Traveling and clothes and things like that. But and still, I knew oh. that it was not possible. Like, yeah. my, there was so much going on at home. My mom just had her last baby and um, it was just too much. And, yeah. uh, and so I had to say no. And because I said no, I couldn't be in the drill team. The girls came to me after I had dished out all the costumes for our talent show contest mm. and whatnot and said, we can't do this talent show because we can't be seen with you if you're not going to be on the drill team next year. Damn. So dumped me and took my stuff and took my dance. Uh, yikes. Well, you know, you don't want to be with them anyway. Well, uh, yes. You know, and then my, my brother comes home from seminary school and he, um, he and I w- used to love to dance together. Our, our garage was like dance routine place. Cool. And, and so my sister had been dumped by her friends a couple of years earlier and her and I weren't getting along at the time. But because when I came home and I said what had happened, they were both like, we are going to do this. You're yeah. gonna <laughs> and you're going to do it anyway. And I was like, I can't, I can't do it by myself. And they were like, yes, you are. So it, it became this hilarious story where my sister Mary, her and I had fought so hard. She went out. She literally, she literally stole an outfit from a store. Ah, oh, how cool! Yeah, I didn't know she stole it until later. But it makes it so much better that she did. Yes, <laughs> and she stole me an outfit. It was like a red night negligee. Yeah. And- <laughs> um, crazy. And then my brother helped me with this dance routine. And then we would show up and I signed up. The teacher said I could sign up by myself. And then we faked everybody out and said we were doing material girl. Um, so they <laughs> it would be a surprise because we didn't think we would, we could do like a virgin. Sure. And then my brother decided that he volunteered to do sound so that he could do this. And, <laughs> and he was, you know, the out of towner in my town because he didn't go to school there. Sure. So um, and he was super cute and sweet and so everybody said yes and we had this master plan and when I did the show I came out and did like a virgin and it was it was one of those moments where I could tell you right now there were so many suggestive moves in this routine <laughs> that all I all I saw is when the lights came out and the curtain opened I had a little curtain of beads that we had found, 70s beads. <laughs> and I go through the curtain of beads and then everybody just freaked out. Cause of course I don't even think about it, but I'm naked. I think I'm pretty sure. naked in this negligee. And you know, and I had like ZZ top, like like little socks on with pumps, you know, it was, cr- yes. and I'm 13. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> A legend. And, and all I remember is nailing the whole thing. And, and for, you know, four minutes, I was Madonna. But I was also Madonna, the essence of Madonna, where all the kids during rehearsal knew what had happened. Sure. So even the really talented kids that should have won this talent show, yeah. like who actually played the piano and yeah. the violin, <laughs> like all of them were actually behind me. And I had this moment of like, I'm doing, this isn't great. Madonna isn't a great performer, but what she's saying is you can be yourself. Yeah. The confidence of being yourself. And that I felt it in that moment, the weight of the room of all of us underdogs. And and I nailed it. And I remember I couldn't see anybody because the lights were in my face. And mm-hmm. by the time I did the last splits <laughs> <laughs> up, I looked up and the whole floor was screaming and yes. it 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 was a whole room connection of us all wanting to win about being ourselves like i broke the rules yeah <laughs> half a girl doing the naughty thing <laughs> and i was a good person like everybody knew i was a good person i wasn't you know i wasn't a slutty girl it wasn't anything i looked like a farm girl who just sure. trans- transformed into this thing and that is how i got into theater really because that 
that winning that talent talent show, and then my dance got second place with the girls in Shebop. I won <laughs> twice. Boom. You know. Boom. And then, and then at the end of the show, you're gonna laugh. The big end number of this whole talent show is "We Are the World." <laughs> Perfect. And everybody Perfect. locked hands, and all the kids who didn't win were all over me in that moment, just being like, "You did it!" And and what they were saying is, "We did it. Yeah. We beat, we beat this <clears throat> label system, this class system." that our town was engaged in the 80s. Everybody did it. Sure. Socially, no matter, you know, where you were. And and it freed me. It freed me for when I got into high school. I didn't have a click group. I was friends with everybody. And at the time, you know, everybody was labeled a jock or, of you course. know, we were the smokers at the green box or, you know, whatever. Right. You were. And I didn't have to do that. Nice. Because everybody supported me in that moment and by the time i got to high school i got this magical experience of thinking for myself and being for being myself and um i wish everybody could have that moment because yeah. it, was, it was the moment where i decided to leave my town and i realized that there was something else out there for me and hollywood was that place where i was like that's where dreams come true i'm going yeah and i believed in that line and sure. I left at 16. I I literally really? left school on my own. And I convinced my parents to let me go visit a brother I didn't really grow up with. Mm -hmm. And he lived in Orange County. He was as close as I could get to sure. <laughs> Hollywood. Sure. And, um, and when I got to Orange County, I was like, yes, I have to be here. And I told my brother, I said, I'm not going home. And when I called my parents, they... My mom was upset, I think, because, you know, I was a dutiful kid and I did the housework and took care of the kids and sure. and took on that responsibility. And I just said, I can't do it anymore. I have to find myself. And my mom, my, I remember my mom saying, and I, I don't want to talk too bad about my mom, but but she did say she was the, this is what it's like being number nine. She sure. said, what, what kind of grades did you get? Uh, what, of course. What did, like she knew that. I was that kid that was outside the box because I was making my own clothes and sure. my makeup looked like 80s kabuki. I mean, yeah. I was <laughs> cross between like goth some days and pop some days. And sure. I, was, I was the only one in my town at that time that was expressing themselves physically. I made my own clothes since I was a kid. And having cool. eight sisters, cool. I had chopped up our wardrobe because we, we didn't have money. Sure. So I would chop up our wardrobe and make them into current news or or their own things. And so we had like the world's largest girl closet ever. Perfect. Right. And so I, I, I'm only doing what I've always done, but I, I was, I went to, I came out here to be an actor and I sing and I yeah. dance and I do all those things. But um, I think I realized in Japan, um, I had gotten a job in Japan where I met Keith, my husband. Oh, cool. Um, we met on a plane going to. <laughs> no way. Yeah. You did not tell me this. Yes. So, That's awesome. So when I was in college, my my sophomore year of college, um, I was in a theater conservatory and I was going for directing and acting. Oh, cool. And during that conservatory experience, when I hit the costuming, I was winning all these awards at school and competitions for clothes. And the the shop supervisor came up to me and she's like, you can't be wearing these. You have to come into my class. <laughs> and so she was really instrumental in me really thinking on the other side of my brain, like, well, maybe costuming is that that thing I love. And I was starting to realize that what I loved about costuming versus acting, I love character study. Oh, gotcha. And the cool thing about costuming is you don't just get to be one character as an actor. You get to have control of contributing to the whole. Yeah. And and my directing love is that as well. Like, I want full concept and characters. How, what is all of these relationships? Sure. And then um, my, a good friend of mine was killed in school unexpectedly. And mm. my professors took me aside Sorry. and they said, thanks. It was It's another life lesson, you know, one of those. Been there randomness that actually it was mm -hmm. the instrument into me going deeper into self and right there with you right yeah been down that's, that road yeah so i uh they said would you would you like to take a semester off at the same time i just directed 
a show with Cress Williams, who was in my oh. school. He was Black Lightning, so Perfect. he's a good friend. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, he seems and, so nice. Yeah, he, I got to direct his senior show. Dude. And, yeah, and um, and I had a friend of mine's dad, who was a director for Disney, had come to see my show. And he invited me to audition for a show in Japan. And my professor said, well, if you do this, then take take the semester or year mm -hmm. off to grieve and go somewhere else. It was a great opportunity for me to do that. Cool. I got into the show. And then when I got on the plane, I sat next to Keith. Wow. <laughs> and I love that. We ended up being partners in the, in the evening show and directing a few of the little vignettes in the park. How cool is that? Park. Yeah, and so we've been together ever since. I, he's wow. he stayed six months. I stayed almost a year. I came home to see if it was a real thing, and and we've been together ever since. That's amazing. We're going on thirty years together. Wow! Congrats. <laughs> Thanks. That's but you know, awesome. It, it was interesting. Then I came back, and um, from that trip, and I spent a lot of time in the costume shop in. Japan because costuming there is just an extra it was an extraordinary um experience we were wearing clothes from Bill Hargate who's an amazing designer in Los Angeles mm -hmm. in the park and then I would go into the shop and watch them do the care and feeding of these clothes and um and I didn't speak the language very well but costuming is only one it's a language unto itself so sure. I was able to like really look at that and when I came back from Japan I came to Los Angeles. I eventually got a job on the first season of The Simpsons as a PA. What? And, uh, yeah, and as they were wrapping up and going into Rugrats, I Perfect. got on the team with Edith Ann, which was a Lily Tomlin project. Mm -hmm. um, that that turned into Duckman, so I worked on Duckman. And, awesome. Yeah, it was fun. And then the Wild Thornberries um, and an and a English it. show called Stress Derek. But really enjoying the animation aspect because that was starting to be my film and and television education through cartooning, which is sure. half hour full features basically. Yeah. You know, and so you're learning that on the illustrative point as I was developing my costume design. Uh -huh. Learning character through animation is just archetype stereotypes. Sure. Sure. At the at the base level, but it's a great way to understand that. And then I was getting paid. I was like, yeah. the only starving <laughs> artist that wasn't starving. And sure. and then on one hiatus, I got to work on Ren and Stimpy with what that company with Spumco when that transitioned to Nickelodeon. Yeah. Um, with Bob Camp, John Chris Felucci was archiving Jimmy the Idiot Boy and doing those things. Mm -hmm. So I was just exposed to some incredible artists. Yeah, I'd and then say. I. And then I joined Keith's theater company, The Actors Gang. Jack Black was there and John C. Riley would do shows there. And so then I'm, I'm exposed to these amazing other actors who are all iconic in their own right doing that. Yeah. Tim I Robbins, The Actors yeah. Gang, man. Yeah. Absolutely. And then learning that Commedia style of um, archetypes and stereotypes, which is a whole other like long line of historical. Um, sure emotional uh emotional character work you know how to create it emotionally and yeah. um dude that was such an incredible education and then i just started designing out of like out of the gate and winning winning awards i think it's because i just didn't censor myself i was like okay what am i doing i'm doing all this so i was putting all of that knowledge in um on a cheap level talk about designing outside the box i mean we worked at the actors gang our, our budgets were tiny yeah. and they were like let's do these 36 people shows and we got 500 bucks go sure yeah. you know that's so, eight dollars per person let's figure this out right. I, can, I can do it so, right the second show i ever did there i won an award for that i was co-doing with another artist who's amazing but i was working at class key the whole time like mm -hmm. from like nine to seven and um, and then I'd go to the theater. I don't even know how I was alive. I would do the theater and then I would <laughs> build these cautions. So I, I was doing Rodgers and Hammerstein's um, Cinderella and it was a co-pro at the same time. It was Cinderella, Medea and Macbeth all happening on stage at the same time. Oh. Um, directed by Tracy Young and Bill Roush who eventually went to Organ Shakes and is yeah. now in New York, I think doing the public. I think he's at the public right now. Um, 
But it was a huge feat. And I said, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't do all three shows, but I'll do one. So I decided to do Cinderella. And I have to confess, I, I ran out of time. And I think I hot glued the whole show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember coming in. And the clothes looked amazing because I was doing amazing, like, you know, hodgepodge of all these things. But I was like, I, I don't have time to finish. This is too, I, I was doing a full-time job on top of a full-time job. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I was sleeping maybe four hours a night during this whole thing. And then I came in and the other designer said, um, I was looking at your clothes because she couldn't figure out how it was, how it was <laughs> making this stuff so fast. Sure. <laughs> she said, are you hot gluing your clothes? And I said, yeah. She was like, how are you going to wash them? I was like, I'm not. <laughs> they're going to wear these for four weeks and I'm going to spray them down and they're works of art. And well, I can't tell you how it's going to, but this is how it got done. Sure. And then I won an award for the show, for my portion <laughs> of the show. And then afterwards she was like, you're right. You have to make do with what you have. I'm like, this is how I got it done. I mean, yeah. some, sometimes you have to look at what you're given and then you have to make sense of it and just go, go do yeah. it. Yeah. If, if I had to do it all by myself, mm -hmm. a full musical, <laughs> you know, for, for four hours or five hours a day for three weeks, um, it never would have finished. Right. That's and then so I told nice. the actors, I was like, Hey guys, I can't wash your clothes. And they're like, eh, okay. Yeah. Well, they don't care. It looks cool. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I know it looks cool. They were like, okay. Wow. So I remember one of the actresses one night, she was stayed late and I said, I have to hot glue your outfit. She was like, cool. That's the only thing I can do. And we sat and we became really deep friends over the hot gluing fringe on this incredible outfit. It looked remarkable. I mean, since then I've learned how to get the support I need. <laughs> yeah. But it taught me a lot about, um, ingenuity and what that means and sometimes yeah. you have to break the rules in order to um come up with something unique and original and sure. so i ha i teach people younger you know younger designers now i'm like you have to break the rules if if you say no to yourself at the beginning of the conversation you'll never get anywhere sure yeah oh no i can't do that well find out who can and for me i'm always like okay i can't do that maybe i know someone who can yeah that's such an important right. thing to figure out and like to not like know your strengths as well, I think really helps. And like, I, I admire it so much that you're not, you figured out a way to not get in your own way. I feel like a lot of people, myself definitely included, when I'm like, oh man, but I don't know. And you know, you poke holes in your idea before it happens kind of thing. Yeah. Like, which I guess with practice, eventually you're like, oh no, we'll just figure it out. And then yeah. finish, what is that? Finish not perfect kind of thing. Right. You know? I think when I when that I, I did this show uh, for 10 years at the Evidence Room Theater, full musical made out of 99 cent store product. Wow. The idea came in the early 2000s. The director says, hey, I'm at the 99. It's so interesting. And it is. It's so colorful and crazy in there, right? Sure. And, and, and it's just, it is the American fetish of crap. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not amazing. None of it is amazing, but right. it's for a dollar. Like, right. And that and that literally is Southern California panning for gold. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, it's what are you gonna find? Ah! So right. um, but I remember he made me walk through with another designer, walk through the store, and it was the first time I was like, Yeah. I mean, I had made stuff out of, you know, alternative stuff before. Sure. But this was Okay, the game is what? It can't be on stage unless it's found at the 99. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> All right, if I can't sew half of this stuff. Sure. And that's when I my my best friend zip ties came in. Ah. Um, and I was like, zip ties are the key to all things. <laughs> and the ace in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> Forget that stapler, zip ties. Are for <laughs> Used to be duct tape as the universal solvent, but now, haha. Well, I have to say, <laughs> duct tape and zip ties, if they if they could be my children, I would yeah. live them forever. <laughs> Nothing that cannot <laughs> be solved with one or both of those things in right. life. <laughs> right. But that show became so popular. It became such an, uh, an L.A. Um, love holiday. It was at the holidays, and people would come and be inspired by the fact that we were freeform designing things out of plastic and 
Yeah. Paper. And and um, it really was one of the most joyful times in my life because it was me being able to express myself um, without hesitation and then I got to invite all my friends who are designers to participate and then everybody would come for three weeks and contribute to the whole and what came out was something incredibly original unique and it's the closest thing I can say was a happening yeah. like it, it was happening in the moment and the actors just I mean they allowed us to put them in <laughs> these plastic <laughs> crazy contraptions and then they would blow the lid off of their own vessels in creating something that was just a, a, a cataclysmic combustion of of joy. And that's the yeah. only way I can explain that. And I got to have that. A lot of people don't get to have that in their work. Sure. And then Disney came to see that show and Anne Hamburger came to see that show um, with my friend uh, Matt Almos and asked me to come in and interview and I got Toy Story the Musical. And what? For six months, I was like, "How? Am, who am I to do Toy Story?" <laughs> <laughs> After working with junk, sure. <laughs> and and it took me a while to find my place in that idea sure. of doing that show because Toy Story is one of the most extraordinary feats in in storytelling. Yeah, agreed. And hit Pixar on the map, and still. Pixar is mm -hmm. the the most revered because of its storytelling through its form yep. and the excellence of pioneering technology and mythology in storytelling. Each yeah. one of their movies that comes out, there's something new that it blows my mind and just what they're doing on all Same. aspects of form, right? Yeah. And so after watching Toy Story 300 and you know, <laughs> million times, it never disappointed. Right. And so I designed that show, maybe 400, 400 designs in wow. all the way from wanting to make sure that actors with disability had an opportunity mm -hmm. to perform on stage, which I really do think is Disney's responsibility if they are, are the top echelon of being able to afford change. They need, to, they need to be doing that more often in more responsible and cutting edge ways. Mm -hmm. of doing I agree. It. At the time, I understand insurance. Our sure. insurance is the biggest detour we have of progress. Totally. And and that's that's disappointing in the fact that we're just not working on that. Yeah. And to be able to ensure the safety of of performers across the board, but for that our disability, our friends with disability can perform alongside. Agreed shows so that i think was my way in i think once i started designing things in that level i think disney was like okay come on board you're you're our gal and um and then at the end of the day doing so many different forms i was like i really don't want to see any of these characters these toys any other way than what they are yeah and i don't want to break you know see the see the actor in there unless i have to sure um, um, but with our my big guns like Rex and um, and Slinky Dog and Ham mm -hmm. and Mr. Potato Head for sure. No, yeah. these are iconic toys. And if I was five years old, if I saw oh man twelve by twelve Rex come out of a and this was for oh, a cruise yeah. ship out of the wings of a ship I know is only this big, yeah, it's gonna <laughs> blow my mind. Yeah, and and so for me. I think, you know, I didn't learn this from other designers, but when I sit in the theater that's going to house the show, I realize the POV is up most theaters, right? right. Yeah. So if you're in the front row, you're looking up on the back, your, P your POV changes as you go to the back of the house. Right. And, but for half that theater, if you're sitting in those seats, your mind can be blown pretty, pretty well if you look at yeah. that. Active. So I like to design from the feet up. <laughs> interesting. And so it and it's interesting because American theaters are all built similarly. Yeah, there's a formula. Right. And so if you look at someone's shoes and the, it it needs to say exactly who you are all the way up. <laughs> yeah. And um and for like Buzz Lightyear, I really concentrated on uh printing a textile of craters on that white fabric that normally would just be a plastic oh. white. So if you were a little kid looking up at Buzz, 
you would get con- this subconscious idea of the moon that he's yeah. talking about. And so each one of the the details of the pieces were altered to make sure that that bird, that little kid's POV yeah. could change the idea or manipulate what they were seeing and tell the story of it. How so, cool is that? It's like yeah. full immersion, even if they're not realizing it. It's like yeah. subconsciously being like, oh, you know Buzz Lightyear and then space and then moon and then it's like, uh. That's yeah. genius. But it took a long time with um, some fab collaborating with some fabulous um, vendors like with Buzz Lightyear. He has to be picked up on a on a on a line so he could fly for a little bit. Right. He has to. So you have to build the shell of the torso around a harness that that poor actor is wearing <laughs> from the sure. thigh. <laughs> so that poor boy. And um, <laughs> and and then for Disney. Th- his costume has to fit a kid who's five seven to our first buzz, which was six one. Realizing wow. that that torso accordion needed to be the way that we stretched that costume. Oh. Um, he has, you know, laser in his glove. His wings have to work, which is a ten pound back of the back. How do you balance that on an actor's body? So yeah. He- three different packs that were common on coming off so that he didn't have to carry it the whole show. Wow. He has a dome. Yeah. yeah. To talk through and then wear. So it's a lot of responsibility of balancing weight on an actor who not only is just doing a straight play of Toy Story's doing sure. a musical. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 Multiple I, okay. times. It's not like yeah. it's a one-off show. On a ship that's on a at ship, eight yeah. o'clock <laughs> traveling the fastest. Oh. Deep right. In, so there are, there's so many components to like, what? It, it literally is like a joke. You're like, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah. And how are we doing it? <laughs> and where are we at? So like the inflatables, the reason why we chose inflatables is because in order to get that giant Rex through the door, which the side door of the stage is only four foot by four foot. Oh, yeah. Entering and exiting. It's into the bow ah. of the ship where the pipes are. Yeah. That's where the theater oh. Is built. Oh. So you had to you had to inflate and deflate upon entering entering oh, and exiting, no. and then you have to time the battery system to do that. Oh. oh, I do not want to be in charge of that. Just the stress of figuring out that like time on a live show that right? there's no there's no take backs, there's no pauses, there's no start over in the middle. Like, ooh, I'm sure That's that stress. they didn't inflate one day. I'm yeah, sure of it. I had to. <laughs> It had to have been at least one. I didn't one. see it, but I'm sure in the 10 <laughs> yeah. years that it was out there. Yeah. But, but then you have to just the responsibility of it, you know, yeah. putting on these costumes on actors and hoping that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't destroy them physically and sure. balancing it out. And there was no way I was going to be able to get those costumes on if they were hard shelled or. Yeah. So I worked with Michael Curry, who designed Lion King, and that was a real oh, honor to sweet. work with him because he's such a, a fun engineer. Yeah. And, beautiful show i've seen that yeah, one with the yeah. animal heads on top of everything oh, yeah. beautiful. he's incredible he's he he's the success of lion king his yeah. interpretations are extraordinary Agreed. um and his whole team his brother works for him and his whole team up in oregon um they are really deeply rooted in process and mm. and pushing the envelope and i just love what they do um they are you know he is someone that inspires me to achieve yeah better results but that's cool I enjoyed that. but it was great to be able to talk to the pixar team and sit in a meeting with john lasseter and his team talk about color and background and you know when you look at toy story the the um the movie you know it's the wallpapers and the backgrounds and the, the deeply layered lighting yeah changes the atmosphere and conversation and i wanted to make sure that when michael was painting um the costumes up in oregon uh, of the big guns like with rex his painter was genius yeah able to talk about that and get that that deeply saturated dimensional look sure on the, you, on the you find that you like because with what you're doing you have so much creative freedom to do things do you find it just as creative when you're working with like an existing ip because you have to translate it because i know you've worked like Pee Wee herman on broadway i know you did toy story i know you did parts of the caribbean like you're, yeah. you're living in the world, <laughs> but you also have to do your own thing. 
Like it's hard to take iconic be, right? pieces. Well, here's the thing about Jack Sparrow is you know uh, he's not owned, trademarked by Disney. That's oh. that's a Johnny Depp piece. He bought the rights to that, which is Smart controversial man. to me. Sure, because you know Colleen Atwood did ah, did the work of the design point. on this costume good he point. added some trinkets and baubles and then got the rights to this whole ah, thing gotcha. but then again there there is this conversation about actor and designer contribution sure. and jack sparrow is distinctly johnny depp you know doing um a very vaudevillian character that's distinctly Johnny Depp. Jack, sure. Jack Sparrow and Johnny Depp are kind of one and the same in this character. Right. And I, I get it. Sure. Uh, but it's that like costume. Character design. Where's right. the Where's the line mesh yeah. and meet? Yeah. That's right. But the Definitely. silhouette and clothing on the body is distinctly Colleen Atwood. Sure. That's her design. Right. <laughs> and then Disney separate owns them. it all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's but, all their toy box. Pun but intended. doing Pirates of the Caribbean ride in Shanghai, they merged all the show characters into one. Gotcha. And, and then we could blow it out by making it cartoony, like for stage, like we, we sure did a cartoon level of what Pirates of the Caribbean is. But I did have to talk to Johnny's people, and they did give me parameters of what I could do for this Jack Sparrow. Oh. And so for me, the Jack Sparrow in my show had to fly in an air cannon without a harness. And uh, I had to create a Jack Sparrow costume out of fabrics and threads and and fuse that so that it could not be blown apart. Oh. Uh, so the trick there was it had to look like Jack Sparrow, but sure. it couldn't kill my actor or drag uh, him yeah. down. <laughs> drag him down into air cannon. So so what I love about the fact that okay I'm doing this iconic character but I the function of it is distinctly engineering and costumed to sure. look like that but my trick was how do I take this costume and make it foolproof sure so, so his wig is on a helmet so it Perfect. doesn't off. it's made of soft fabric so it can't whip him in the face and lacerate him <laughs> like a, in there Sure. So there is all sorts of crazy tricks to that one. And there is distinctly different Jack Sparrows. So those are our stunt Jack Sparrows. Right. And then a regular Jack Sparrow does have to do stunts. So he's a completely different costume. Oh, um, okay. So that he can't hurt himself when he jumps into, uh, jumps off the, the balconies and hits the beds down below. And Sure. So there's so many wow. tricks. I love that. Yeah, right. And then Pee Wee, working with Paul Rubens, who is an incredible artist. Yeah. And then working with that iconography. Now, I can talk about it now, but they had lost a bunch of money at the beginning of that show because they had a, a crooked producer who walked away with the money. So by the time yeah. we went to the Nokia, it was, you have to pretend you have a lot of money. And so now you have a final uh, money. And sure. now you have to do Pee Wee Herman. And let's get Anne to do it because she can make something out of nothing. Right, yeah. <laughs> the 99 cent, yeah. Which is not what you want to do with an <laughs> iconic piece. No. Where you're stuck over the holidays when everybody's out of town oh. doing Pee Wee Herman uh, with, with potatoes. So Yikes. But I came to Pee Wee late. I think it was 13 when I first saw Pee Wee at mm -hmm. someone else's house. And I was like... Perfect. What the heck is this? <laughs> um, so when I was asked to do that, I mean, there's a moment in your life where you're like, oh, my God, I'm working with my childhood here. Yeah. Like, who am I? And I literally felt like I was eight, I think, in the whole process of that. That's you know, awesome. Where I'd turn around and be like, where am I? Is this for real? And did I die and go to heaven? What's happening? Sure. Um, working with Lynn and John Paragon, like the sure. uh, original characters. Um, but I thought we did the best we could with what we had to blow the lid off of that. I think the my favorite piece in that um, was um, do, being able to do a bedazzle rip away <laughs> suit where he does this love this love number with Cherry, and I just got all my friends over a weekend to glue on the suit because we couldn't afford to have someone actually bedazzle the suit sure so we did it a la elvis you know oh like fantastic if, if, yep. if he was doing an ode and i also wanted to do 
the Phoenix Rising of Elvis, Elvis's jumpsuit yeah. for Pee Wee because this was Pee Wee rising from the ashes and coming onto Broadway. Yeah. And so I did this whole Phoenix on the back, design on the back, but they had to be rip away too. So sort of like oh. 20 pounds and a rip away, gem, you know, 30,000 gems. But asking other artists to come in and help me do it over the weekend, Margarita weekend. Um, was also special because I also allowed my friends to be a part of something huge yeah, and, and allow them to contribute in that way. Um, but just really being able to work with Paul and I've worked with Paul since and, cool. and off with things. And we, we've been, be, be, he's allowed me to become friends with him and cool. be able to learn from the way he thinks about sure, iconography. Sure. I mean, he's created an icon character. Yeah. That has inspired so many characters um, since and um, his place in the history of, of artistry. He's one of the only actors who've produced and mm -hmm. directed yeah. and performed in his own material and he owns the rights to his own materials. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. Especially these days. Yeah, no, most producing is a networks and sure and platforms I don't let you do that that's how they make money off you so right he's quite inspiring and lovely to work with and he's completely honorable and yeah cool, cool. So i feel awesome. fortunate i know that same that right after that i got to work with um all the british greats in what about dick with eric idol oh dude i know and so there was a moment <laughs> Where I got to sit in a room and talk with Tim Curry about his legend costume as I'm dressing Tim and being what? able to like discuss with him because he's you know one of my favorite people of all time. It's Tim Curry. And and, and, and and then having having um, um, Jane Leaves who is amazing. She's uh, from Fraser, but yeah, oh my God, she's incredible. Um, she's super generous and um, shoot, I'm forgetting. Why am I forgetting? I can't believe I'm forgetting her. <laughs> Tracy Ullman. We... How can I forget oh, Tracy oh, Ullman? Oh. So Whew. in a fitting with Tracy Ullman, who literally does a 45-minute show for yeah. me in yeah. cost with the costume oh. she's trying on. And I'm crying as I'm trying, trying to, to do my job. And she is so incredibly fabulous and wonderful. And um, and you know, being able to take my kids backstage, and they were so young that I think Vice knew who everybody was, but Ruby was at that age where she's a kid where she's like, I don't know who these old people are. Sure. And, and um and, you know, she kicks herself in the in the pants as she grew up <laughs> to like watch D Tim in sure in great movies. And as she was literally arguing with him on the couch not knowing who he was. And then <laughs> Tracy Ullman give me a hard time about parenting. Um, sure. And a really funny exchange one night, making fun of me for like an hour. And I'm delighted because I'm like, sure. where am I? This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. So I, I think I was blessed. I've been blessed to like work with incredible people. And, um, and I think there is the return of blessings when you, when you start to see people for who they are, you know, yeah. when I work with people and I'm like, this is who you are. You're an artist. And, and, um, we're going to, you get to a point where you're like, okay, I've earned the point. I've earned this place where I can collaborate with these people and sure. sit back and do that postmortem mortem of self and be like, okay, where am I, where am I at in my career? This is really crazy. Yeah. But I, I, I just enjoy what I do and I love what comes and what I create. And I don't yeah. worry about where I'm going next because I think I'm just more infatuated with creation and process. Sure. Being than present. I yeah. That's what I love about theater versus film is, is theater is about process mm -hmm. and doing something live is really freaking hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's a miracle really. Yeah. It's a miracle. And um, and then with film, you you get time to perfect yeah. the craft and, and perfect it one moment at a time, one second at a time. Mm -hmm. But the but theater, the difference when people don't know what the difference is, you're like theater is a miracle that it happens at all, yeah. all at the same time in a two hour period. You get two hours. Yeah, go see how great it gets. Yeah, it's nuts. I I've talked to a, a lot of people over the geez, six years I've been doing this. And a lot of the people that I have talked to who've grown up in the theater and have done that versus a lot of people who've done a lot of movies and other mediums, 
the thing about theater is that it is alive. It is the immediate returns. It is what it is. There's no take backs. If you mess up, you keep going. Uh, there's so much wrapped up in the tornado that is the live experience. Whereas this film, you know, there's that saying like you make a movie three times. It's like when you shoot it, yeah. it's like, what is it? When you write it, when you shoot it, when you edit it and it can change and you have multiple takes to choose from. And if you mess up, just start over and do it again. Right. It's, there's more forgiveness, uh, not in theater, whereas theater and you're in the trenches as well, because you have that thing where, oh, we all just went through this. That was wild. And we have to do it again tomorrow. And it can be different. And it's that's right. It's exciting. But structured the same. Like, yes. I, you know, I think, you know, the difference is, you, you know, in film, you can do as many takes as you want and then they'll select the one that's great. Yep. When it's live, the structure has to be there in order for it to work. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't understand, like, how much practice it gets to get the structure, the bones of it in place so that you can be emotionally available. Sure. And sure. And I love going to opening night to something that I really love and closing to see where they went. Yeah. Because the more you ride the bike, the more interesting it gets. Sure. When they find and moments around like week two and a half, you're like, oh, oh, I could try it this way now. Right. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm, I'm of, the, of that mind. I get really I get really frustrated that in theater right now, we're not allowed to to film rehearsals. Sure. Which is is like saying I'm not going to use the most useful tool. Yeah. I have <laughs> and so it, I agree. I hope it changes because what I, what I, now that they've condensed our, our process to a three to six week process, sure. Depending what you get, what your producers can afford that filming actors and rehearsals for them to go home to see how they're doing. Yeah. It's like giving them extra performances. It's saying, okay, now we're going to give you a year's run <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in in three weeks. Yeah. And it only makes it richer and better. And why would you not want to make it the best it can be? Because the money it takes to put on a stage show yeah. is so huge. And often you don't see those returns until, sure. unless you're on a Broadway show and you'll see it 15 years down the road. Sure. Because you're, you you have 60 producers now for every yeah. damn show, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that list is so big now on Broadway. You're like, what the? How right. do you, <laughs> Did There's anybody tell you, tell you people you don't make money in theater? What? Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's interesting. You know, it's a very, it's like the lottery. It's only, a, it's only one person wins an Oscar and right. one person wins a Tony. And hopefully you get to go on tour for the next 10 20 years <laughs> yeah is the is the process do you find that it's similar is it more similar or more different across like uh working on broadway versus working on like smaller theater versus theme parks is there like a common denominator between them that you're like this tool works a lot if that makes sense yes they all have the same structure bone the, uh, the same bones of process yeah. It mm -hmm. different the difference is you know in film you're working on multiple locations you're working with titles like they're you know the designer title um gets broken up into different departments within uh, your gotcha. so you become like a whole department in gotcha. film in theater the designer is singular and then the theater provides depending on what size theater sure <laughs> provides sure, sure. a department for you and so those job duties are are specifically for theater and what the theater comes with. Now, your Lord Theater and your Broadway Theater comes with staffing and departments. And, sure. And then you have vendors, too, as well, like in movies, like other people who are building your stuff. And yeah. Shoppers and whatnot. You, so you do have that in the larger thing. Smaller theater, <laughs> you become all of that. Ah, gotcha. Which is a good way to, like, learn what everybody's doing so that you become a sure. better better boss you know sorry 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 right um so there's that um that makes so, sense yeah and then um and then if you're doing opera it does come with the staff or you hire it out depending on where you are um gotcha. opera's fun and the fact that it's fast and it's huge yeah it, everything's cranked up yeah i mean opera you know i think originally was the church for the intellect of people Makes who sense. go to church, you know, and it's a, it's a valve, an emotional valve where you're telling a story, sometimes not in your language, 
but it's evoking an emotional human response. Sure. And, you know, like I cry in movies. Same. Oh my god. I don't for really real. cry in real life for anything else. I'm the else. same way. I'm the same way. <laughs> and I go there and I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah. I'm releasing my pain of the year. I do and, the same um, thing. <laughs> yeah. It's my safe place. And you know, do you know what's really crazy? Is like if I go to a movie, I, I recognize this in my twenties. I'd go to a movie, mostly on the weekends, like on a Sunday, so it's kind of sure. like going to church. Yep. And I would cry and almost be borderline sick by the time I came out. Like, I think I have a cold now. Sure. <laughs> I, just, I just emotionally <laughs> wrecked myself, you know? Yeah. And, um, but I still do that. And now, you know, by the time I was in my late thirties, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a bottle of wine and then look up all my crying movies. There you go. There you go. Get the catharsis. <laughs> That's right. Which you is always a good empty. gift back to get, you know, like yeah. here's your crying pass in basket. Yeah. Here we Happy go. birthday. <laughs> You're 50. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, right but, uh, yeah, but, you know, I think, you know, it, it still, it still is like that. I just, I don't know if you, you listen to the podcast, but I got obsessed with Midnight Mass. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I listened to it. Coming out. And yep. uh, it became really personal for me with addiction and, and the Catholic faith wrapped up in my childhood. And, and it's so awesome to see a series that speaks your language as much as oh, it yeah. to me. And, and as intelligent as Mike Flanagan's work is, uh, For real. I get so excited. But it is a, it's like therapy. And, yeah. and it's, it's, it's so, good. I love that. I love that as well. It, it's funny. My wife and I watched all of Shameless like all 11 oh, yeah. seasons. So I also grew up super poor and there were things in Seamus when I'm like, oh, right. Like spe yeah. I specifically remember one scene where Carl, the youngest boy is going into these like abandoned houses and he's ripping pipes out. And Monique, my wife, Monique, she was like, what's he doing? I was like, copper. She's like, what do you mean? I go, it's a, trust me. I know exactly what he's doing. <laughs> they don't acknowledge it. I'm like, you get, if you get copper piping, you can sell that for a lot of money. Or yeah. If you get copper wire, you're really in for it. And she's like, what? I go different worlds, different worlds. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think when Cleveland was, you know, we went to go do a show in Cleveland, there are all these abandoned buildings and I'm like, ah, oh, it's going to be hard to reopen those. There's no yeah. copper in those buildings. Yeah. <laughs> Just free money. Just sitting right there. <laughs> It's that it's, it's that representation that, that for better or worse, you know, okay. it's like the language that you see that you would only know if you had been through it. And it's like, that, that's oh, right. It's cool. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you when this will date me. Okay. All right, In college, that. when Jerry Springer came out, oh, perfect. all my friends thought it was so funny and I felt validated. I was like, Oh my God, they're same, doing a reality same. show about my family. And I took it so personal. Yeah, same, same. I'm like, I know I that guy. Wait. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't wait to watch it. I was watching it like, oh my God, I can finally talk about like where I come from. Yeah, right there and with you. And then when I found out it was faked, I was so mad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, you're like, for, for a second, you get a taste of exploitation. You're like, oh. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Jerry. Yeah. She's not really afraid of pickles. Yeah. <laughs> you lied to me, Jerry. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But it's so funny when I tell people that they look at me like, what? And I'm like, yeah, this is that was my life. That was my yeah. literal chaos. Yeah. So people do live in that. They do. Yeah. Art imitates life. <laughs> yeah. And it's very validating. You know, I've made my brother, my older brother, watch Midnight Mass. And the main character, Riley, is his story. Gotcha. And we had we we actually had to watch an episode together because it was so emotional for him. Sure. And the next day he called me and he said, "You know, am I a narcissist?" I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he's like, "I, I really thought that was my story." And uh, when I watched it, knowing that this is peop this is other people's stories, yeah. and it's finally now here. And I said, "How did it make you feel?" And he's like, "Validated." Yeah. I was like, yeah, you're you're not original. This, n these ideas aren't original. These are these are collective stories, so that you mm -hmm. know that that all your secrets have been secrets that have been told before. Yep, yep. On the tapestry of the human experience, it's yep. there. It's there. You and, just got to find it. That's right. And movies and stories and theater, pro they they make your pain real and yes. they release them. 
so that you can yeah. be free of your own mind's inability to express it. So if it can express it for you, there's freedom in that. I think that's why I do what I do. Yeah. And, and I, I used acting when, when I thought I wanted to be an actor. It was really one of those moments where I was on stage doing a very uh, serious scene while singing and it was so real i literally felt sick the next day yeah and I, and I said to myself oh i'm doing this for therapy i'm not doing this because sure <laughs> i love this yep I, this is not my place because the heaviness of my real life is too much if i continue to do this i will destroy myself yes i think i i've watched too many actors do that mm -hmm. and, I, and that was when i was in therapy myself and i was like you're right i have to protect my craft and my storytelling and what what is the best version of that and i realized my gift was costume design sure and, and that i can explore these characters in a more healthy way sure and be able to express <laughs> it to the best of my ability and i also acting was work for me in a ah, destructive way sure and when i design i'm having the best freaking time yeah that's when I was like, oh, you kind of want to make your work be that place where it's n not so effortless that it's you're not working. Right. Hard enough. But that's that's my wheelhouse. And yeah. I didn't know what my wheelhouse was until it presented itself to me. That's how they work. It's like it where, wherever you can find that fulfillment, that word specifically is like, ah, right. The rest of me feels better with this thing. Right. Got to find your thing. Right. And I, I've had other artists um, that I've worked with um, that have partnered with say to me, you're you're not serious enough to be a, you know, a, a, a costume designer. No one's going to take you seriously. You're too <laughs> sustainable. And um, <laughs> you always say that you don't know. And and I do. I always say, oh, I don't know. Oh, let me let me figure that out. But that's right. also why I get hired because they know Anne will figure it out. Right. But, but I'm okay with saying I don't know. I'm okay. Like my favorite thing in the world is when I get really tired. I get giggly and ridiculous, and it's always like the last shot, and and we've run out of ideas. And then the thing we put it in and it ends up being the best thing because it's yeah. it's at that crazy delirium place where you sure. go, <laughs> and and I love it when something magical comes out and. Yeah. Can't stop laughing, or I'm like, oh my god, that's hideous. It's perfect, <laughs> and then it goes out, and everybody's like, I don't know, do I trust you? You look crazy. <laughs> and then I, sometimes I laugh so hard, I'm like, I'm gonna pee my pants. I gotta get out of here. This is too much fun, and I know I'm in the right place. <laughs> yeah, that's the place to be when there's no inhibitors <laughs> anymore, and you're just free. Yeah, it's so much fun. I remember painting. This guy couldn't fit in anything, and I just decided I was going to paint him head to toe silver and put a diaper <laughs> on him. And I put a diaper on him and, um, you know, a crucifixion crown. <laughs> and he looked, and he looked like a giant disco party, but biblical. <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, "I don't know what the hell this is, but this is great." <laughs> it makes you look like you are irreverent but you have a lot to say and it oh. killed it killed it was That's just so funny <laughs> those are the things that you <laughs> that come out to be the best things you you don't even plan on but yeah. i was like let me close for you man what are we gonna do that's I right got, <laughs> i got some silver paint and a diaper let's so, go and a crown right. of thorns how did those things even enter the room close yeah <laughs> I love that. Is there, is there something like in your mind when you think back on like, because obviously everything that you do has your heart in it, but is there somewhere you're like, this particular one is kind of, I really, really like this one, this creation. Um, I have to say, I have a lot of those actually. I bet. I have I a lot. I hope so. I'm, I'm the person who has a new favorite. Like people are like, what's your favorite movie? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> right now? <laughs> right. <laughs> Because I'm I'm always looking forward, which is yeah. really interesting because everything forward, someone has already gutted the past to get there. Right. Good point. So, so there's always some new provocative thing. Like, I really love the squid game right now. Oh, yeah. 
love all the derivatives and it is so clever so smart so gutsy so guttural so regular like it's all in there in one big push and i love it it's so much fun um so it's like i always have a new a new favorite i think the 99 cent store shows probably the most amazing thing i've done to date even though i've done my my craft has actually evolved past that. Sure. But what it did is give me the opportunity to freeform something and give it away. Yeah. And know that it was the best thing it was while it was moving and it was it was being used. And and that to me is the most freeing idea about art. Like it's all disposable. Like yeah. you watch a Netflix series and you're like, well, it's done. What's on to the next one? Sure. So, so, and knowing that your art is disposable, um, so I would have to say those, and I, I, I probably created thousands of wow. outfits during that whole process. And there was one of my favorites was I did a whole gang army out of little boys' birthday hats and made them into armor. Oh, and sweet! Armor and then painted them, knowing that it was little boys going to war. Yeah. That was the most provocative thing about that night. As I was making those, you know, we were hearing on the news so much about people dying in Iraq, and and um, and I was just and contemplating the news and then what you're doing at the same time, even though yeah. it was possible, like how important it was. And then I made the other army coin roll covers. You know the oh yeah yeah uh huh. I got I got no oh, fifty million of them from the <laughs> store. And then having it, making it, it ended up becoming Roman and and making Roman helmets out of coin rolls. And it was like, there's nothing more wow. powerful talking about how we keep saving our economy through war because that's all we know how to do at this point. Yeah. And we, in my whole life, I've been at, we've been at war. 50 yeah. years that I've been alive, we're using war as commerce and we pretend it's patriotism and it sucks. Yeah. And, Agreed. You know, and as we're going into the the end of that, I think, because I think global citizen means we're all going to be accountable to the fact that we're all humans. And, and yep. now we're all going to, through climate change, going to be refugees of where we're from. We yeah. better get a big handle on that in a big, fat, hairy way. Uh, and, agreed. Um, and if we go to war through resources, we can't, can't continue the stupidity of what it is. Yeah doesn't make any sense and and i'm excited about the change of where we're i mean as Same. everybody's like you know as i tell people this is like my fifth apocalypse with my mother yeah. <laughs> you'll get over it you'll have a sixth one it's all good um, first time <laughs> yeah it's really funny people are like what do you mean i'm like yeah pandemic end of the world it's yeah. it's happening don't worry this about is just it. this year we're all right this is how we make it up every time that's right um, <laughs> But um, I'm excited where we're going. I think, you know, the fact that, you know, we have the capability to deflect this, the heat of the sun and we need to just yeah. do it. That It's here. It's whether or not we're going to organize to talk about it. You know, it's yep. really cool in technology to see what's coming out and what we're capable of. Um, so I think there's going to be a last minute hurrah. So Yeah, same. We're too smart. Agreed. Dude, Agreed. We're- we're talking about doing like Disneyland rides to the moon. It's so yeah. depressing. <laughs> really? We can afford that, but we can't yeah. afford to clean up Louisiana. Come right. on. Right. So Something you're... isn't adding up here. Yeah. Mm. I always call it stupid human tricks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the focus. And I think, I think what I'm excited about with this younger generation is, they are um i think they're kind and they're they're smart and because of the pressure cooker that's on them um you know th- what they're hearing you know that climate change climate reality you mm-hmm. know our our money our polarized politics all of this is so so weighing on their their minds that they are going to find a way forward that we're yeah. going to have to ask for help from our younger generation and be like 100% okay, I knew you got I'm tired that's right yeah <laughs> so, yeah I'm right it, there with you it's hard because I think my parents generation has been sold a bill, bill of goods from World War II on down so there is this 
you know, this, I'm going to go into a bunker, into a hole, you know, a hole and save yeah. myself sort of thing. But, mm-hmm. but as they move on to the light, they're going, we're going to be left with another generation who has just been left with Bunkers. this antiquated <laughs> 50s ideology. Yeah. Which yeah. we're still stuck in in all things. Yep. And then, and then go into this 80s, like, maybe capitalism isn't the right way to think about things. <laughs> if only. <laughs> and then, okay, and then how do we fix the soil to plant and how do we mm-hmm. build things here and what are we making? I'm seeing the younger generation going to crafting. There's like knitters, yeah. and sewers, and trading, like seeing. And circling back. Yeah, Again, and it's cool. The importance of art because you got to be shown those things. And I, I, I do love that of your massive award-winning career, the 99 cent one that was limited resources with a message is what sticks in your head. I think that's awesome. Well, you know what it is? It's it's community. And yeah. I do art in Los Angeles. I do art wherever I go, whether yeah. whether it's with my girls group or, you know, when my kids were little, all up until they graduated high school, I said, if I do a show, you know, for the world on a economic level, I will do one for you. I always did their school shows. Oh, I cool. always did art exercises in their classes. And um, I always volunteered to do that with them and brought them with me in that. But I believe in community. I live in LA. Mm-hmm. And when people say community theater, I just laugh. I'm like, well, I'm in Los Angeles. So that I get yeah. a high <laughs> level of community theater. Sure. But I do participate in my local museums. I do participate in my local parks. I do go to my community meetings and get involved to raise up not only the industry and the global aspect of where I travel all over the world, but I'm taking care of where I live at. And yeah. this is a hard thing for Los Angeles because people come from everywhere. Sure. Live here. But I think when I, when I work in movies, people work so hard, they forget that they live here too and that yeah. they should be contributing and raising up your local theater. Sure. You know, where we are, we could have. L. A. is so spoiled. We have so many resources. <laughs> sure. So many, from commercial print to you know, from art, I, I can costume so many things, and I have outside yeah. of all of these mediums. And um, so I'm lucky here that I have space and resources. Yeah. But we also, don't connect that to each other. So sure. I think what makes me a better artist is that I look at L. A. and I'm like, wow, you have Koreatown and. Uh, Filipino town. I have, I I have you know, um, little Mexico. The first streets ever in yeah. our the history of our relationship with Mexico or Chinatown, which is in California our first relationship with commerce of overseas. Yeah. Commerce. So we have this incredibly beautiful community um, that I need to invest in at the same time. Sure. And that's why I love the ninety nine cent store because that was for my community. Yeah. To bring them together and say, "Hey, look how cool we are," and yeah. in theater, New York's like, oh, "We Broadway, this, 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 and this," and LA has shitty theater. And I'm like, "No, we're just spread out, yeah. and that's what makes us unique." And yeah. yes, some is <laughs> better than others, of course, but the voice is still the same. Yeah, and and if not different, different because we are pioneers and frontiersmen. Yeah, you were there, you stayed on the on the East Coast. Yeah. <laughs> close to home that's right you're just milling on the same turf that's we right all the way across the country <laughs> to land in in paradise in the sunshine that's right so tell us of our sunshine that's right and our eclecticism exactly because, because la and san francisco are the first real cities of diversity let's talk about diversity. definitely Definitely. We are the real, true idea of what America is because Agreed. we decided to explode together in a, a different, unique way. And we were happening before the law came in and said, you can't. Mm-hmm. And then we have cla- classism is here and of course. racism is here mm-hmm. um, because that is unfortunately what the American dogma has kind of been about. It's like, yeah. unfortunately, we're uncovering that 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 history in a really big rude way right now which mm-hmm. is awesome because we agreed to rip off that traumatic band-aid and start talking about agreed <laughs> progress but, it's right I, it's right here that's right but i feel fortunate being here i'm an i'm an la kid i i, oh, I yeah i 
was born in Orange County on this side of the the world, but I feel at home here because um, of the way that we make stuff out of nothing. People came here to make dreams happen, and I get to make dreams for a yeah, living. Yeah, you do. Oh, I'm a dream maker, and I that's love it. right. And I think people came out here for dreams. I think I'm. I that's my addiction about being and what I do. Sure. I'm addicted to making dreams possibilities. I love it. I, I live by that quote. Uh, it's from Star Wars. Uh, your focus determines your reality. My entire existence is based on that sentence. And right. it is one of those things. Yeah. It's, it is possible. It is possible. And you see it from concept to show. And there's got to be. It, it's it's and magic. Life. And yeah, life. Yeah. Like, yeah. Look, look, look at what I got to do. I got to. I come from a really big family. It was a very tumultuous, hard working family mm -hmm. i left that to make my dreams happen and i did and along the way uh, you know when i turned 40 i realized oh my god i've done all my dreams yeah. that was all i had dreamed up until that point i i have a beautiful family of two kids i'm married to the love of my life i i we worked really hard we were poor you know we had my we've we've gone in and out because it's cyclical as you are your yep. independent contractor it is what it is and then we I, I found a partner where we both support our dreams and so that we're constantly going to the next place we're not stuck in yeah. in feeling that we were cheated out no everything's always forward and so I feel lucky that I've been able to have this life where I've gotten to uh, make my own path yeah and, and go to the next place and now I'm I didn't graduate college and now i'm teaching professor at usc yeah you are Come on! Oh, was another oh. and i'm like you can do it and i'm yeah. like that because i have you know 25 years of experience in my field but but those things are a possibility i've just just never have had to say no yeah oh, i love that so much that gets me so hyped about just life the possibility it's like yeah yeah look like you did it it's a real world example it's not just like a, a quote that you read on the side of a wall. Like, no, you've you've literally lived it. It is possible, and you yes. can see it. Ah, yeah, and not, then I'm like, not get excited. Do I want to be a costume designer anymore? Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like literally, I had that during the pandemic. I was like, okay, so who am I? Okay, I do that, but I really don't believe that Anne Claus Farley. You can't just describe her by being a costume designer. I mean, that's not my identity. Yeah. My identity is that. I am an artist, a mother, a daughter. I'm all these labels. Yeah. But most importantly, I'm a dreamer. I yeah. what next? Yeah. I like, love that. What next? And there is no formula for success. It just no. is possibilities. 100%. Leaving that nice room in your yeah. life to go like, "Oh, what? I, I I don't know. I've never done that before. Oh, let me try this on. Oh my god, I love this." Yeah. And then by your love and affection for something, sometimes you conquer it. Sometimes you break the ceiling. Sometimes you pioneer something you never thought would even enter your zeitgeist. And so leaving room for those experiences and for those opportunities that you never thought you would be able to, to be a part of. And just getting in the room. And sometimes just, I always say, just joining in. A lot yeah. Of people are afraid to join in. And you're like, so what's happening over here? Oh my God, can I be in this room? And then people generally will say, yes, you yeah. want to come in. Or or when you say, I always say to kids, I'm like, just call and ask. Everybody wants to tell you everything. Yeah. <laughs> like, really? And I'm like, yeah, everybody wants to share everything they know. Yeah. What What's the point of going through things if you aren't able to impart it? Yeah. Right there with you. I made a whole show out of it. <laughs> right? I did. I love it. You're so great to talk to. You're so, oh, I love it that you've stop it. made a career of just being genuinely a good conversationalist. Cause it's you're all good. I do. You know, it's a code that I cracked. I had, <laughs> I tell people I had no friends growing up because nobody wanted to be my friend, but somewhere along the road, I figured out the code. And yeah. And what, what, what did, what did you figure out? I want to know what that is. What did so, you figure out why it was? Here's what I've found out. Because also, this show is not what it originally was. It took probably 30 episodes before I realized, oh, this is what I do. Um, it's about being, like, you have to be yourself first and foremost. And that kind of is the key to all of it. Because if you are specifically unabashedly yourself, 
it gives other people the freedom to be unabashedly themselves. Right. When you get rid of the idea, because my show is not like I, I know your work and I'm a fan of it, but I, I'm so much more interested in the person. Like, for instance, with Keith, we didn't mention Mass Effect or Fallout once. And, <laughs> not once. Right. And so when when I it also makes the show impossible to promote because you're like, what's the show about? Uh, I'm going to talk to someone who I find interesting about probably whatever pops into my head. You know, right. I don't go in with notes. I don't go in with like there's no question. Like I don't I always I have to tell people all the time. I promise you it's not an interview and you'll figure that out very quickly. And if you're coming here for answers, you're not going to find them if it's right. what you think it is like. I'm going to get to know someone. So I've learned by being entirely yourself and seeing the person behind the work because i've had on people from like oscar winning visual effects artists to the fbi negotiator at the waco incident to my dad like nice anyone it's whoever i find interesting and so like talking with you in your living room i knew right away i was like this is somebody i would like to get to know better i did not know at the time that you were an award-winning costume designer who's been working for 30 years and super accomplished i just know you as Anne, who has great dogs and i was like i would like to <laughs> I have great talk. her into hanging out with me for a while. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's I was, about it's the true. truth, you know? Yeah. There's, yeah. there's something about that, that there is that societal norms of like, you have to, good morning, how are you? I'm good. Okay, have a good one. You know, whereas I, I remember I was at work one night and I was going in, I deliver bulk orders of newspapers for stores. That's my survival okay. job. And then I'm an actor during the day. And so I remember one night back when it used to get cold, uh, I would walk in and some guy was like, morning, how you doing? I was like, I'm cold. And I remember saying that his entire body language changed. And he goes, it is kind of cold, isn't it? And just that really stuck in my head of like, oh, I broke the rules here by not caring. Like, I'm good. How are you? Okay, see you later. Just saying what you would normally say. And by opening up, I gave him permission to open up. And then we had a real moment of I see you, you see me. And I'm, I've gotten pretty good at that at seeing people and like as they are and as a human being there's no preconceived notions here it's like i'm a person you're a person even though we could be all of the outside layers could be total opposites at the core we're still people and on that i can connect with you and i've, I've figured it out that's what i that's what yeah, i do now <laughs> so it's fun it's fun i really like it i always tell people um when they say oh you know when did you when did you know you made it and i was like what yeah, <laughs> it's a true question because, um, really, I I knew I made it when I realized I was loved for who I am. Yes, as I with my work. Yep. And and then I say I'm only as good as the life I lead. I don't yep. want to be a dead artist. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> get the credit when they're dead because that's yeah. just a waste of time. Agreed. And um, Agreed. And I, I don't need I'm I don't need to be a genius. Yeah. I don't need to be the best. Yep. I need to be able to somehow find a middle ground where all of it is working and I'm not abusing myself in the process. Sure. And and uh and I have done all those things. I have like yeah, you have. not slept. I've given myself anxiety from from Of course eating well i've i've done all of it you know yeah. and um I, I remember going to this meeting at paramount for a project and the opening meet and greet everybody was <laughs> comparing their autoimmune disorders <laughs> <laughs> i literally thought it's like this is like a larry david sort of you know episode. Yeah. <laughs> but literally everybody was talking about the alimony and the palimony they were paying and you know sure how much in debt they were and they didn't sleep for the last 16 hours and i came home to keith and i was like who am i what am i, why do I want to life? like why do artists want to punish themselves so much like for someone else to have a normal life am i sacrificing myself so that someone can watch this on tv while they're relaxing after work right but i don't get to relax after work and i, I had to look at that pain and suffering yeah for what for what reason yeah and I go, no, I kind of like my holidays. I haven't spent a holiday where it's, yeah. <laughs> I it for two decades. Yeah. And and wow. I had to like reevaluate that system. Sure. For myself. But I think that's when I realized I made it. I was like, oh, look, I have balance. 
This yeah, is I'm right here. I'm enjoying it. I'm actually putting out my seasonal decorations, not on the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I have time for myself. You know, that 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 has been great. I I absolutely when I was maybe twelve or thirteen, I think I said out loud to my sister, I probably won't make it till thirty five. Yeah. And there. life was so hard. I just was like, No, I don't there is no future. This if this is what it's gonna be, I probably wouldn't make it. Um, sure. And so when I think about that kid to when yeah. I trained Transitioned into someone who began to believe in dreams again, mm-hmm. and then and now I've escalated to like, oh yeah, it's endless. Like I'm good. Like I've, yeah. I am lucky that I'm in a place where I'm like, okay, what's my next dream? Yeah, I love that. I love. I always I love talking to people who have achieved their dreams because it's like, now what? <laughs> it's exciting, and I feel like now what the pandemic did for me which was take everything away yeah, so that I could look closer about where I want to go to the next place. And I turned 50 and my kids are going to college. So I'm into these great, great, you know, stereotypical places. But, sure. but at the same time, I'm like, oh, heck, this is awesome. Yeah. I get to date my husband again. I get to like Boom. figure out do and 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 after i made some like lists of things that i wanted to do that's when the usc job came up and i was like yeah i haven't done that before yeah let's let's try that on yeah this might result into some more stability that's (laughs) what does that word mean (laughs) and just being there for the last five weeks i was like oh i'm a natural born teacher and i really love this age group and I really like telling them the truth about what the business is really like. Hell and I, yeah. what I realized is my new mission is work-life balance. What yep. is that? Let's pioneer some of these bad practices in our business. Yeah. And really, really, that's the only thing I can offer these kids is can we, can we really do change some of these practices so that they're healthier and that we are providing balance for the people that we make art. It, they deserve it. Yeah. So and and that we need to believe that we don't have to sacrifice our health and well-being to make art. Yeah, I totally agree. There's no excuses to bury our brothers and sisters in art. When I see that memorial, you know, memorand every year in the movies, and then I make the lists of my friends who, who, you know, didn't make it for personal, emotional, or physical well-being mm-hmm. for, for reasons they didn't have to end that way. Sure. It's ridiculous. It is. And it is. Every year we go, oh, it's too bad. And I'm like, well, okay, what are we doing about it? Like, it's true. Really about it. And we can. And I'm excited because it is a possibility and it is there. And I feel like it's going to get there. I really do. Yeah. I feel like we're, t- I think there's enough of us taking up the torch right now and really yep. the conversation. And again, the blessing of a pandemic mm-hmm. is that Zoom became this tool. Yeah. We are now communicating at an exponential level. Yeah. And It'll never go away. I think we're here to stay with that. I agree. And then the pandemic gave us hygiene. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wasn't all bad. No. <laughs> got and glass like, half full. Yeah. I'm going to wear the mask in, I think, for the rest of my life in certain places. Why not? Like, yeah. I liked not having the flu last year. Yeah. yeah for real. Awesome. For real. And I get the flu in every show I do, especially musicals, because everybody's coughing and coughing and it's October. They usually a lot of them are starting the fall sure. and and so i was like no nah, I'm, I'm keeping that one that yeah. one's a <laughs> I, and i've been more aware of my hygiene like i've, I've never been before because right? i work with chemicals and dyes and blah 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 sure. and now i'm just like huh yeah i'm gonna take care of myself a little bit more so it's not all bad make sure that's right we'll come out of this on the other side i feel i feel pretty good about it Oh yeah. I mean, I think these things, contemplation, contemplating a deeper self and a collective, it's only going to make us better. I think so too. I think so too. And Anne, I could talk to you for literally hours. I know we should probably, <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to release you into the wild at some point. So right. before seeing you out here again, definitely before I let you go, I have to ask where can people find you online? Where can they see some of your work? 
Oh, yeah. Um, I have a website. It's, you know, anclossfarley.com. I'm the only person on the planet with that name, <laughs> which is awesome. Fantastic. And, um, and so you can see me there. I have an Instagram, um, my name as well. And um, you could just find me all over YouTube if you put my name in there. Yeah. I'm connected to so many thousands and thousands of shows. It just comes up. <laughs> I love it. Get that yeah. SEO. <laughs> yeah, right? So I did. I have a friend of mine gave me, uh, he put my SEO at the top platform. Perfect. 10 years ago. And Beautiful. no one's ever bought me off. That's right. And if they do, I'm coming. <laughs> I think it's awesome. That I'm the only one. So if I've done a show with you, everybody goes, I'm so glad I did a show with you. I come up everywhere next yeah. to you. <laughs> Got it. Coattails. Coattails. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. And. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.